talk, I'd like to sort of address what you guys just heard to preface the ideas that I'm going to try to share with you today. So what we just did is what jazz musicians like to call a collective improvisation. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Every member of this band was at the same time improvising based off of each other's ideas. So one aspect of this collective improvisation that we tried to focus on was call and response which actually originates back to the work songs that African slaves would sing while working on the fields of a plantation. So, for example, I might play a musical phrase and Coleman could choose to respond to it and we could kind of go back and forth in sort of a musical dialogue. So to demonstrate... <laughs> Sean can do the same thing on their instruments as well. So, one, two, one, two. <laughs> so, as you can see, jazz is definitely a conversation. We're not just reading notes off of a page, but we're engaging with each other, we're communicating, and most importantly, we're inspiring creativity in each other. So it's a collaborative art form. So with that, I'd like to move to the question that I'm going to try to address today. How can jazz change our perception of genius in a modern context? Well, typically when we think of a genius, we like to picture this kid with like glasses and big hair doing like, um, like crazy math or physics problems. And I'm not trying to discredit this kind of talented individual, but uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to offer two important lessons from jazz to hopefully reconsider what we consider a genius today. So lesson number one, collaboration yields genius. So when I was approaching this question, I was inspired by a TED talk given by the writer Elizabeth Gilbert to look at the origins of the term genius. So the ancient Romans believed that uh, inside of every person, place, or thing was uh, its own individual mythical creature known as a genius. So, for example, in the workplace of a sculptor, the genius might occasionally come out and guide that artist's work. And that's how the Romans would account for creativity. And it, uh, it really stayed that way for many years. But a lot of you are probably thinking that that's a crazy idea. But it's actually a lot more relevant than you'd initially think. Every member of this band was inspiring creativity in me, and I was doing the same for them. And uh, the Romans thought it was people, places, and things. So my surroundings as well play a role in my creative process. Things from my past or present, like what I had for breakfast, or the music that I listened to last night. Everything sort of feeds into my flow of ideas. So uh, that being said, we can move on to lesson two, which is that innovation stems from past ideas. So I don't really consider myself a genius by any means. So to provide a better example, I'll talk about someone who I do consider a genius. So Charlie Parker was arguably the most influential American musician of all time. In the 40s, he revolutionized jazz completely. One thing that he was really well known for was rewriting popular music in revolutionary ways. So for example, we have this common chord progression in jazz called a 251, which sounds like this, Colin. So it's three chords, and it's a very common sound. And uh, here's a diagram of the thing that we just improvised over. This is a blues form, and we have a 2-5-1 at the very end right there. So this is kind of like poetry where we have a set form, 
and you have to rhyme in certain parts or have a certain number of syllables. Well, in the blues, we have to play certain chords at different parts of the form. So what Charlie Parker did was he took this idea, which is a 2-5-1, and it actually existed years before he was even born in like classical music too. But what he did was he took it and he applied it throughout the whole form, and it really revolutionized jazz. This probably doesn't make any sense, but um, it changed the way that people approached improvisation in general. And um, so what he did was he took this previously existing idea and used it in a new, innovative way. So to make sense out of this, we're going to play for you a bird blues. And keep in mind that this is the same basic structure as the first tune that we played, just with some modifications that Charlie Parker added later on. sophisticated in terms of harmony and the technical aspect of playing my instrument. So this was sort of a turning point in jazz because people stopped looking down on the music in a way that some people look down on like hip hop or rap today and they began to consider it a high art form on par with like classical music or opera or dance. So on a slightly separate note, I was on Twitter the other day and my friend tweeted um, if the light bulb was only invented in the 1800s, how did people get ideas before that? <laughs> and obviously that's a joke, but it points out a common misconception about uh, uh, creativity that our language is kind of created. So the author Stephen Johnson points out that phrases like stroke of genius or epiphany or light bulb moment imply that innovation occurs in instantaneous moments. So they think it, people think that you just get a new idea on the spot, but that really isn't the case. Uh, for example, the technology for the Macintosh or the iPhone had existed for years before they came out, but it was the way that Steve Jobs used these old technologies that made the product successful. And uh, Isaac Newton, for example, he didn't get hit in the head by an apple and realize that gravity existed. He studied the theories of past physicists for years before he came to this conclusion. So he himself said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, for Isaac Newton, these people were like Descartes, Galileo, or Kepler. But for Charlie Parker, he had a broad range of influence as well. First of all, going back to our first lesson on collaboration, he had so much help from contemporaries like Dizzy Gillespie, Max Roche, or Thelonious Monk. But before that, before he even moved to New York and met these people, he studied for like 15 hours a day for a number of years the works of like uh, Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins, and even Stravinsky, a classical composer. So if we look at geniuses throughout history and sort of keep these trends in mind, we'll see that almost any genius, like Charles Darwin, Isaac Newton, Steve Jobs, we can see that they all use these lessons, these uh, ideas of innovation from past ideas and collaboration. So the theme of this TED event is beyond content, skills for the future. Well, if we want to make it in today's rapidly changing world, we can't keep perpetuating the idea that genius is entirely based on natural individual talent. In my opinion, this can give you an advantage or a head start at most, but in the years to come, the most meaningful innovations of our generation will be products of innovation from past ideas and collaboration. So that was a lot of talking to do in 10 minutes. So to close this out, we're going to play a more modern composition by Roy Hargrove. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to demonstrate the evolution of jazz. So we played a very early song in the beginning, then we played something from the 50s, and now we're going to play something from just a couple of years ago. So this is going to start with Coleman Hughes on the piano.
Thank <laughs> you. 